uh, and folks can also, as I was saying, uh, proof that it works. Uh, and that way, if folks are in class, they can watch later. Um, Rachel Bade is uh, now mic'd up. Is it working? Let's see. Can you hear me? I think we can. Uh, and Corinne Demergian, uh, both the authors of Unchecked, uh, the new book, uh, The Untold Story Behind Congress's Botched Impeachments of Donald Trump. Uh, and their day jobs are uh, covering Congress, covering politics, covering midterms, although you're just back from maternity leave. So you've had a blessed little break from yeah. all two babies the, this year. Really. All the, <laughs> all the, the all the wildness. But um, why don't you tell us both what your day jobs normally are, uh, and, and that will help us get to why you wanted to write this. Um, you want to go first on what drew you to this? Sure. So um, I, well, right now I'm actually a Pentagon correspondent for the Post, so it's a little bit shifting gears, but that just tells you how long it takes to write a book sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was on the national security team, but the person on Capitol Hill that was covering those issues. And so I was covering the intelligence committee and like the judiciary affairs and, and foreign affairs and, and, and defense things. And then uh, the Russia story, I mean, the, the, the Russia investigations were the first chapter of the, the Trump presidency, right? And that turned into later impeachment investigations happening in similar committees. So Rachel was uh, on the Congress team covering congressional leadership at the same time. And we kind of ended up being the frontline reporters by default at the Post because of our, our beats um, covering the, the first impeachment of Donald Trump. And that's when you know, we didn't actually know each other that well before this all started because Rachel had only been at the paper for like six months before the impeachment investigation kicked off. Mm -hmm. um, but basically we were scrambling, spending over 12 hours a day easy, taking out these meetings and, and trying to chronicle every turn of this impeachment investigation and saga and realized there was a whole lot of murmurings that we were hearing from our sources and, and things going on that we wanted to pull back the curtain but just did not have time to do, nobody did. Um, and that led to the idea in mid-October to try to tackle a book project, which was a first for both of us. So there were a lot of like questions at the time that, you know, we didn't we felt like we didn't have good answers to. Like we would always we write about this in the in the preface a little bit. Um, we would sit in our meetings at the Washington Post and our editors would be like, what do you mean they're only gonna have Two weeks of hearings like that doesn't make sense and nixon they had a whole year of hearings and they kept you know suing well they, they would subpoena nixon's inner circle like why are they not going after all these top dogs in the trump white house to bring them in and to question them under oath um and at the time like democrats were like oh you know we've got the goods we're just gonna move on but like there was just it just didn't make sense and it didn't make sense why republicans well, obviously publicly very much defending Trump and falling behind him. But like we would hear stuff off the record about, you know, them being totally appalled by things that Trump was doing and they would just never say it publicly. So we sort of felt like there were lines that we could investigate or threads that we could pull in terms of like actually getting this full story of why Democrats moved so fast and why Republicans just let Trump do whatever, even though some of them had concerns. And then there was, of course, this public perception that both of these acquittals were inevitable and that nothing Democrats did or Republicans did would have changed that. Um, Is that correct? It's wrong. I mean, we show and throughout the book, and we can talk more in detail about this, that there were various key moments where, you know, but for a couple of hours, but for somebody making a phone call, we might have seen more Republicans vote to impeach and then maybe more Republicans vote to convict. Um, and, and this goes from you know, decisions Democrats made, but also decisions Republicans made too. So um, we just wanted to tell that story of the close encounters and, you know, this, the, the behind the scenes narrative of like, what people never saw, you know? Right, right. And so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the midterms. We'll talk about the next impeachment, which will be likely a President Biden uh, next year. Um, and obviously take questions from the audience, which is the fun part. Um, of the two impeachments, which one was more botched? Can we make an assessment, Karen, of uh, which which was the more bo the botchedest? Botchedest, I like. Botched. <laughs> um, if you define botched as missing an opportunity that you had, right? Mm. I think the second one counts as the more botched one. Mm. Um, we we go into Rachel was referencing it in general terms, but we go into these moments where, you know, there were 
House Democrats who wanted to impeach Trump on the very night of the January 6th riot, before Republicans had a chance to think, before they had a chance right. to think, consider what their political future would look like when they were standing on the floor and saying, I'm right. done with, Lindsey Graham is saying, Trump and I are done, right? Hold them to that in that moment. Right. And Nancy Pelosi decided, uh, I don't know about this. And, 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 and almost a week went by before she changed her mind. Why? Um, what happened? What happened that night? I mean, that night, uh, while the, the congressional leaders were in their Fort McNair off-campus lockdown, while all the members of Congress had been, you know, pulled off the floor and put in these secure rooms around the Capitol, um, David Cicilline and Ted Lieu, who are a Rhode Island congressman and a California congressman, both of them Democrats, liberal Democrats who have seats on the Judiciary Committee, career lawyers before they came to Congress, um, are in David Cicilline's office looking at what's happened. They were two of a set of a quartet of people that had tried to basically orchestrate a mutiny, the first impeachment, to push Pelosi to embrace impeachment. And remember, Pelosi is a, a, a came of age during the Clinton years. She knows that impeachment can be politically dangerous. She's primarily a politician and a, a really good one, um, but not a constitutional lawyer mind. Anyway, so Cicilline and Lou are sitting in Cicilline's office and they are writing articles of impeachment and article of impeachment as the mob is still laying siege to the Capitol. And after they get back to the Capitol that night to finish counting the electoral college votes, they approach Steny Hoyer and they say, we've got this and we have support for it. Let's just do this now and nail him while the iron's hot, basically. And there's a flinch that happens from Democratic leaders, right? Um, this is kind of repeated a couple weeks later when we get to the trial stage. Now, Cicilline, Lou, and their two friends, Raskin and Joe Goose, who were that initial crew, they're the, the prosecutors. We're watching them on TV, right, prosecuting the case. Um, and they want to call Republican witnesses. They want to basically make it impossible for the Republicans, specifically Mitch McConnell, who they know is angry at Trump. They know wants to find an excuse to be able to convict him and an excuse to say, I'm going to lead my party in a different direction. Um, and basically, uh, they are they are shut down in their initiative to try to, you know, they get a vote from the Senate on the last day to call witnesses. But then in the two hours that follow, they get squelched by Chuck Schumer, the head of the Senate Democrats, by senators who have a very close relationship with Joe Biden saying, if you do this, you'll screw up Biden's presidency. Like, we get that you think that you have like the higher moral ground here, but just don't, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. You're just going to lose. And um, Rachel was talking about missed hours, you know. We, we chronicle Jamie Herrera Butler, who's people are more familiar with now than they were then, but she's the the moderate Republican from Washington state, who's the reason that we know that Kevin McCarthy and Trump had a phone call on January 6th, where he said, where Trump was like, yeah, well, I guess the supporters, the people who are in the riot care more about me than you do, Kevin. We know about that because of Jamie Hera Butler. Um, the, the Democrats who were prosecuting Trump in the second trial wanted to call her in as a witness. And she wakes up on the West Coast to find that this is the case on a Saturday. She doesn't know this. And so she puts in a phone call to a person named Doug Letter, who is the House counsel. The House has a lawyer that Nancy Pelosi has handpicked to be the lawyer for the House. And she says, okay, if I'm gonna do this, what do I do? Can you give me advice on how this is gonna work? And he's like, I can't advise you, legitimate position to take, but he never passes on the message to anybody that she's even interested, right? And then, you know, and then a few hours later, because of all this pressure of don't upset our political position with doing this pesky constitutional thing that you're trying to do, it all gets shut down. And, and this has becomes, you know, these are the sorts of missed opportunity moments that, um, you know, and there's not responsibility on just one side. I referenced Mitch McConnell. There's moments in this too, where he had the opportunity to do what he knew in his gut was right, which was vote to convict and be the leader of his party to do that. And he chose instead to adopt this argument that became the kind of mantra of the GOP in the second impeachment, right? That you can't convict a former president because Trump had left office after he was impeached, but before he was convicted. We document how he did not believe that. He was basically telling his staffers, this seems like a flimsy excuse. I don't actually buy it, but he did it anyway, right? Which again is basically because it's scary. It was too scary for people in both parties in the moment to buck the political winds to do what they thought was the right thing. And, and that happened in so many instances that are that I think speak emotionally to the country too, because we all watched this happening in real time in more ways than was true of Ukraine. That 
um, that makes that the bigger botching. Right. Bigger botching. <laughs> the bigger botching. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I feel like one thing I've learned on covering media and politics is um, there are these narrow windows of time where there's a shared reality. Uh, with January 6th, we had four to five hours of a shared reality before the lies about Antifa started. <laughs> And before Republicans were starting to present alternative narratives in order to avoid feeling any guilt or responsibility for the attack. And so to me, that's why that night is so interesting, January 6th, the, 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 the potential for the beginning of impeachment is installed. That was the shared reality window. Yeah. And by the time the impeachment process actually began, uh, there were two different countries with two different narratives about what happened. And uh, I, I wonder if that happened in the first impeachment as well, that you all were talking about this happening really quickly, but I would actually make the case that maybe these, these processes take so long that there can be then a two different narratives, two different realities, two different, you know, um, but that gets to the constitutionality of this. That gets to the importance of uh, checks and balances versus a media and political cycle that is second by second. That was a concern <laughs> that Pelosi had about impeachment and was why when she was pushed into it, because you know we report in the book that she did not want to do it, she tried to shut it down. The first time. The first yeah. time, yes. She, and even in the second one, she didn't want to do it. It took her a whole week um, to get there. Um, but one of her concerns was that you know the news cycle moves so quickly that we've got to do this very. We've got to do this, you know, mm. at the blink of an eye. We can. Their version of the blink of an eye. Yes, yeah. exactly. It can't be like a Nixon yeah. situation. The problem with that, though, is. Well, her concern was that if it lasted a really long time, it wasn't just that, you know, people would stop paying attention. It was that that would hurt her frontliners in these Trump districts uh -huh. that she needed to keep her majority. She was first and foremost concerned about her majority. Secondly, was fact finding. So fact finding was never Nancy Pelosi's thing. So she wanted it over with quickly. But that, yeah, that was a top concern of hers. But the issue with impeachment, though, is that there's sort of two, you can be successful, we would say, in, in two ways, right? not just convicting a president and removing him from office, but also turning the public against the president. And Democrats never went all the way. They never, um, you know, they realized they had their party at their back um, and they sort of did enough to make their case, but never enough to really convince moderate Republicans, uh, independent voters. If you go back and look at the polling, um, these quick impeachments, you know, they never, they never brought in people like John Bolton to testify on the stand about what he had heard from Trump and what he knew of the Ukraine scheme. They never expanded the inquiry to look at how Trump was profiting off the Oval Office, which was something he was doing in all the time, right? And Jamie Raskin was pushing Pelosi to do something, some sort of investigation on that. Campaign finance violations, him paying off women during the 2016 campaign, that's not allowed, <laughs> but they never did anything with that either. There was a whole bunch of investigative threads cases that they could have, they could have done big public hearings, um, had these people from Trump's inner circle in and under oath, would that have changed the public's mind about Trump? I mean, after the first impeachment, he emerged stronger than ever. His Gallup polls were higher than they had ever been. And we would argue that if the election were to happen that day before coronavirus, he probably would have been reelected um, because he was in a stronger position than he'd ever been. And so I guess the point is like, yes, impeachment, is about trying to convict a, a president, kick him from office. But Democrats, you could argue, also had an obligation to make the fullest case against Trump, show him the country that he was dangerous. And they really skimped out. There were multiple opportunities that they could have done a better job with that. And yet Trump is still around and one of the, the Republican who could run again and be in office again. You know. And there's a third thing too. Sorry, I, I, I know it, it, it's, there's, Yes, do you convict or do you not convict? Do you make the case to the American public at the point at which they're actually maybe listening? And the third thing is, what about the next time, right? Impeachment is a, a great case study of, constitution, of congressional oversight in general. It is the one oversight power that is expressly given to Congress in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't really talk about congressional oversight. Otherwise, there's been this tradition that has grown up of oversight of the executive through various other statutory developments that have happened. But in terms of the Constitution, it's just this one. And it says, you know, you're supposed to impeach, Congress has the right to impeach in cases of treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. But it doesn't tell you how. There's no rules of the road for exactly how you're supposed to do it. Everything depends on precedent. And the high watermark, the gold standard of the precedent that I think everybody pretty much agrees on is the Watergate years, right? 
you had um, a, a president who was frankly so popular that he was reelected after the first news stories about the whole break-in at the Watergate had, were out there in the summer, right? That was the, the summer before his, his re-election. Um, you, you end up with a situation in which um, you have bipartisan buy-in, at least a little bit of the GOP was willing to say, okay, we should open this investigation, we should look into it. You had the guy who was running the investigation, the Democrat running the investigation, decide he was gonna hire a Republican to be his staff director and the manager of that because he wanted it to look as even-handed as possible. They ran down subpoenas. They actually flexed all the constitutional muscle they had by going to the courts and getting these decisions that said, yes, you have to actually show up. You have to give these documents, you have to comply. And um, they took the time to build a case for the public that where it became so unthinkable for so many Republicans decided to flip on Nixon. Republicans who had said, I'm never gonna turn on the president ever, eventually did it. And so you ended up in this moment where things did change because of the investigative and oversight muscle that Congress flexed. We think of the Clinton impeachment as being really different. And yes, in substance, it was super, super different. But the model that they followed is exactly the Nixon model in terms of the rules of the road for the impeachment, the due process rights for the accused, the way they incorporated witnesses, the way they treated subpoenas. They followed the Nixon model. Yes, there were politically pressing reasons to not go through all those steps in Trump time. However, because you don't go through all those steps means that your model has basically been downgraded, right? It's no longer, the, pre the precedent is no longer this, this very durable, very structured thing that could be imported into any sort of impeachment, a Watergate style impeachment or a Clinton sex scandal impeachment, right? It is take all of those things away, which leaves it very, very ripe for abuse in the future. And so a third thing is just, you know, not just what did you, what happened with the end uh, verdict for the president or where the public is, but where is your tool? Where is your one constitutionally guaranteed oversight fail safe to get rid of a potential despot or a tyrant that's in office? The, what, what a lot of people in the con law field feel like it is now is basically it's been downgraded from that constitutional fail safe into a tool to express political animus of a higher order. And that is potentially problematic because we're looking down the very short road at a, at a incoming um, House majority that's probably gonna try to impeach the current president. And we don't know what's gonna come January 6th style or worse down the line. And are, is the tool that Congress has going to be there when they actually decide to try to flex that muscle and use it? Right now, it's not a great recent history for actually it being, you know, in prime fighting shape. What both of you are describing makes people think about the January 6th hearings and how uh, when, when you talk about building a case and involving Republicans, involving both parties and trying to show all the, isn't, have, has, has the January 6th committee, is that an attempt to learn lessons from these botched impeachment? impeachment? Yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, we definitely think, and we've heard from Democratic <laughs> sources who perhaps don't like the, the subtitle of our book, but will acknowledge that it's true, <laughs> um, that they've learned the lesson and they are trying to run down the subpoenas and bring in, uh, I mean, they've, they've called everybody under the sun. Yeah, if, if, including Trump himself. So. Including Trump <laughs> himself, yes. Um, and when people are ignoring these subpoenas, they're going to court um, and they're fighting to, to hold them in contempt of Congress. Steve Bannon just got a, what, how many months jail sentence? I think six sentence. Yeah, six sentence. Anyway, that is, that's like, but those hearings are, they're incredible. Now you might question, okay, well, Democrats are doing this now. It's not making a difference. So would it really have made a difference before? Well, you have to realize that now there's this sort of feeling amongst a lot of the public, um, not a lot of Democrats, but a, a lot of the public that, um, you know, there, there's just this impeachment fatigue. People feel like Democrats have cried wolf too many times and they're they're not paying attention. And so the moment to actually sort of convince people, we would say, was is over. Um, not only right after January 6th happened, but like in the in the weeks right around the second trial, Trump was the most politically vulnerable he had ever been. Um, you know, you had Republicans who were talking about voting to convict in the Senate. A lot of them did not. Um, but you know, he there was a there was a moment there and you have to sort of wonder what would have happened if Raskin would have gone with his gut, Jamie Raskin, the impeachment manager at the time, and said, you know, forget forget you guys pressuring me to cave. I'm going to call in Mark Short right now and put Mark Short on the stand 
Because at the time, we didn't know a lot. Like, there was a lot we didn't know at the at the time of the second trial. Oh, it's my microphone. Where did it even go? Oh, here it is. Um, but <laughs> so much so we, didn't there was, we didn't know. And we know it now. But again, it's like the moment has passed. And the, the public is tired. And um, that's sort of, you know, that, that hinders a lot of things when it comes to accountability and, you know, trying to put Trump behind people and behind. And again, institutionally, which is my, my role here. <laughs> yeah. Institutionally, yeah. it's great to try to do all of this now. It certainly indicates that many of the Democrats who are running impeachment too would like a do-over and how they do, and they like to punch harder this time. And that's great. The only problem is that they're trying a former president. They don't have an end game that can be a conviction vote, that can be a vote to follow that saying you can never run for federal or state office again. They have, if anything, a friendly president in the Oval Office right now who is helping them. They have a friendly Justice Department who is, that is willing to take those criminal referrals and run with them through the courts um, in certain cases. Um, but this is not the situation. This is not the test of like, will the system hold? Will that tool actually be there next time? Because if you don't have an adversarial sort of relationship, you do not have an executive, a person leading the executive branch who is, you know, like Trump did, like Nixon did, going to try to stonewall, going to try to push people out who don't toe the party line, going to just block, 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 block with everything that they've got, which is a lot more power than an average, you know, ex-president who's a civilian now, right? And I and I and okay, look, I I, I get that the January 6th committee is doing these criminal referrals. Bannon has a jail sentence. They subpoenaed Trump. They could actually try to push that one the same way. There's also other court cases going on right now that have, have Trump as the ultimate target, if not the current target, that could, if successful, bring some pretty heavy consequences to bear on the head of the former president. But guess what? You can still run for president from a jail cell. That's, it's not the same as if the checks and balances that were designed to prevent this sort of abusive office from happening or abusive office from happening, period, um, were, were being tested because they're not being tested right now. And again, it's a question of like, are, are, are the muscles in working order? Are they limber? Even if it didn't work for this particular circumstance, are they ready? Is the precedent there to be able to punch just as hard the next time? Or is it basically, you know, enervated enough that the next impeachers can come along and be like, well, you, you didn't do all those things, so why should I have to? I'm just gonna do what is politically convenient for me to do. Or for the next executive branch, for the next president to come along and be like, why should I even think about complaint? You're not even gonna be willing to run down your subpoenas. You know, there, There's precedent here for me beginning to ignore your subpoenas and suffer zero consequences for it. Why would I ever go out of my way to try to make this easy for you? And, and right now, Congress has not done anything yet. The House has voted on a package to try to correct some of these loopholes, but the Senate's not done anything on that legislation. And you know, this is not like we're in an era right now, like we were after Nixon left office, where you know Congress passed over the next couple of years a bunch of post post Watergate, post Nixon reforms to try to plug up those loopholes in the system and and, and rebalance the balance of powers a little bit better. That's not really the political climate that we're in right now, and that potentially can exacerbate the longer-term consequences, given what's just happened. Uh, for those who have come in uh, in the last few minutes, uh, Rachel and Corinne's new book is unchecked. It's about the botched impeachments of, of Donald Trump. Uh, uh, so let's talk about then the implications for midterms and beyond, the next impeachment. Uh, Rachel, do you see ways where the, especially last year's impeachment, uh, is going to have an aftermath or have an uh, effect or like have an echo that's going to be heard during the midterms? Yeah, I mean, so before the Trump impeachments, um, the only sort of precedent for a very quick impeachment was the impeachment of uh, Andrew Johnson. Mm -hmm. And so frequently... When you're looking at us, it's, it picks you up more because yeah. <laughs> it's angled. Um, <laughs> there you go, yeah. Um, and, and it's funny because like constitutional experts, impeachment experts, they rarely talk about the Johnson impeachment because it was so shoddily done. They impeached him, mm. you know, in one weekend and then wrote the articles after they impeached him. They mm. impeached him over something very frivolous, which was that the president fired one of his cabinet members that uh, his predecessor had had in office. Um, and uh, they were angry that he had got rid of, you know, one of their political allies. And so nobody really talks about so that impeachment. And if they do, they say it was a congressional abuse of power, not a White House <laughs> abuse of power. But now we have a situation where a snap impeachment has 
very much been legitimized. And you can argue that it was necessary. January 6th was a horrible day in our American history and, and for democracy at large. Um, but now there is this precedent that you can impeach on a dime. And so, of course, we're going to see Republicans try to do that. I mean, we have people like Marjorie Taylor Greene who are going to be in the House. Um, there's a number of House candidates that are running and are set to be elected um, who buy the big lie and, you know, believe or espouse to believe that Trump uh, was the rightful winner of the election. And these people are already talking about going after Biden with revenge. And so there's that precedent for a quick impeachment. There's also the precedence from the first impeachment of Trump, which, you know, we actually would probably argue were more detrimental to the system and to upholding impeachment and the integrity of impeachment. Mm. And that is, you know, in both Clinton and um, Nixon impeachments, the the party that was doing the impeach impeaching, they actually had meetings with the other party and they agree, agreed on the rules of the road for what this whole impeachment inquiry is going to look like. Democrats didn't do that at all. Um, and you can argue perhaps that McCarthy, if he did, probably would have sabotaged things, right? Um, but because they didn't do that, you're going to see one party again do like do a full steam ahead impeachment with no minority buy-in. Um, these impeachments didn't have rights for the minority. Um, due process was a huge concern. We write we wrote in our book about how even though Democrats publicly in the first impeachment were dismissing Republican accusations that they weren't being fair to the president and that they weren't giving minority rights. There was a huge fight between Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler and Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff, who was running the impeachment. Nadler told Schiff that the impeachment, the way he was doing it, was unconstitutional mm -hmm. and that they needed to give Trump due process rights. Um, and that was a huge blow up behind the scenes, even though the Democrats were sort of downplaying things. Mm -hmm. Republicans, I mean, it will be very hypocritical on their part, but I mean, I wouldn't put it past them to during these future impeachments when they try to impeach Biden, they're not going to give him due process rights. And we'll be able to point back to our book and say, look, you guys were arguing for this during the Trump impeachments. This is why you were able to unite your moderate Republicans against the whole inquiry and keep them on Trump's side because of the due process concern. But then, of course, when the shoe was on the other foot, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw them, um, you know, just want to move very quickly. And so there are these sort of precedents, like you don't have to have bipartisan buy-in. You can, you know, not give the president due process. You don't need to even try to run down witnesses to, you know, to try to testify to whatever crime you're accusing the president. And you can impeach on a dime very quickly. And so, yes, this is absolutely going to, we're going to see Republicans do the same thing. You can argue about the merits of it. I mean, they're going to be potentially trying to impeach over policy differences, which is something the founders talked about and flatly rejected. They didn't want impeachment to be used at, for a punishment for somebody in office of, because of a policy difference. It was specifically supposed to be a fail safe to protect the republic. Um, but I mean, I think that's going to change as well. Um, and, you know, experts are telling us they expect we could see impeachments happen for every administration, you know, or at least a lot of them. It's going to become like a very but not frequent thing. convictions. Not Maybe convictions, yes. Convictions may not be the point anymore. Right. Yeah. No, the point may just be to have, like, you know, give everybody, I mean, the, the it, scarlet letter. Arguably, yeah, arguably there is um, a political advantage for the GOP to make sure that they uh, give Biden the same black eye of impeachment as Trump has because they may be head to head again in 2024, right? And then it's like, well, two impeached presidents, so what? You know, it, 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 which goes to the point that we were making before about this becoming more about political messaging than actually what it was designed to do. Right. Uh, let's start to get questions from the uh, from the audience and we can do that both online on the stream as well as in the room. Uh, Liz will tell us if we have any in the chat, but who wants to go first? Uh, let's go right here. Do we need to use the microphone in the room or nah? Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll bring you the microphone. Two people on the uh, here. Oh, there's one right there, perfect, there we go. Let's see if it's Hello. on. It's on. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for the presentation. So interesting. Um, one of the things that I've read as a kind of a political science analysis of impeachment is that this is something parties really shouldn't do unless they have a reasonable expectation that they could get a conviction. So if they look at the Senate and the makeup of the Senate and there's no way they would ever get to two thirds, then they shouldn't do this for a variety of reasons. And I was wondering if you would agree with that as a general rule, or would you see 
maybe not these scenarios that actually occurred, but maybe future scenarios where maybe uh, a party would pursue impeachment for um, principled reasons, even if they knew they couldn't get a conviction. So it's uh, the the mindset you just the, the the argument you just described basically is a perfect summation of what Nancy Pelosi's mindset was heading into the first impeachment. Like if we can't win this, there is no point in starting it. Why open this Pandora's box if we're not sure we can close it again? Interestingly enough, she quotes as she's trying to make this argument as she's discussing impeachment with her leadership team of other representatives. Um, she keeps citing to, she's got this portrait of Abraham Lincoln in her office that she likes to point to and refer to whenever she's in these moments where she's feeling like she's doing something that could affect the you know, fate of the Republic, um, for good reason. And she quotes this line that actually comes from one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, where he says, public sentiment is everything. You know, Without public sentiment, what, what do you have? Which is not exactly a two-thirds counting thing, but the, the quote actually is not to say you got to follow where people are. It's saying you got to lead people along. You got to be the Pied Piper, basically, but in a more good Lincoln way. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you've got to actually, you know, pay attention to, to to bringing the public along with you, right? AKA the Watergate example. You did not have two thirds of the Senate ready to convict. You didn't even necessarily have like a particularly strong majority of the House. Well, I mean, the Democrats were in charge, but you didn't even necessarily have like an impressively strong majority of the House at that point that was ready to convict, right? It took time. It took case making. It took the right witnesses from the inner circle, the first hand witnesses who could put the smoking gun in Nixon's hands to get you to the point where there were so many Republicans saying, this is unconscionable, I can't do it, that Nixon ducked and ran, right, before we could actually figure out if there were two thirds there or what the count would have been in the House. So that is, um, it is exactly the Pelosi position. It's also a very defeatist attitude. Even if you're a politician, right, you're supposed to believe that political messaging can turn, turn people and change minds. If you're basically saying it's not done, it's too hard, so why should I start? Then nobody would be impeached. Unless it was such an obvious, obvious, I don't even know what would be obvious these days, to be perfectly honest. So I can't come up with an example. Of that, someone on but... Fifth Avenue. <laughs> even then, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> it just goes back to the the point from earlier about like, you know, the purpose of impeaching and like not it's not just to get at if you can't get in a conviction of a president, at least turn the public against him. And so I guess in that from that perspective, you know, if you have a president doing something totally out of control, but you know they're not going to get a conviction in the Senate, you can at least do oversight and investigations to try to show the public what you know or what you suspect and try to sort of tell the people why this guy is dangerous. Um, and, you know, something we write about in the book is um, that during impeachments, Democrats believed, and it was interesting because they never actually ran down this theory, that even when you have a president that's stonewalling all your Hill investigations, is refusing to give you evidence and witnesses to make that case to the public. They believed that if you started an impeachment inquiry, it would move very quickly through the courts, that mm -hmm. it wouldn't take years the way a typical executive versus legislative branch court battle does, which normally takes like three to four years. It's like, you know, at some, someone argued not even worth it. But in that case, an impeachment, because during the Nixon impeachment, they were able to sue and they got evidence within three months, they got the Nixon case. Um, and Democrats were of the mind that if they did something like that, they could force Trump to turn over all this thing, all the things that he was stonewalling from them to make their case to the public. But they never tested that theory, which is really, we found that really interesting because Nadler was espousing this for, you know, the whole first year of, of um, after the Democrats flipped the House. Mm. But then, you know, when they actually had the moment to do it, they didn't, they sort of chickened out. Um, and also were concerned about Pelosi's timeline, and they didn't think they could do it under Pelosi's timeline. So anyway, point being, there's a purpose, public purpose for impeachment and investigation. And the second one being, you know, if you're in an impeachment, you can potentially have a stronger congressional tool to show the public what the president was doing uh, and try to make that case to turn them against him and, you know, vote him out of office if you can't convict and bar him. So. Mm -hmm. As we talk about the brokenness of impeachment, it's it's a reflection of the brokenness of Congress and of our system. You are also the, for people who don't know, the co-author of Politico Playbook. Uh, Politico Playbook. Uh, how do you do? You feel like you all get at that enough, or how do you try to get at the, as you're covering the daily, like the 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 the, the bit by bit of politics? Do you feel like you're also able to capture 
the the grand problems that befell it? Befell it? That's a good question. I've so I worked at the Post. I mean, um, before I came back, I was at Politico for six years. Uh, went to the Post for two years when the Democrats were doing this oversight of Trump, um, and then went back to Politico. I would say that you know, different media organizations have different sort of strengths and different sort of purpose. You know, at the Washington Post, we wrote a lot about, you know, um, the institutions and stonewalling. I can't tell you how many Trump stonewalling stories, I wrote, like talking to experts <laughs> about like how bad this is for checks and balances and all this stuff. Um, at Politico, it's more of a DC, DC yeah. or political focus. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of coverage of like the personalities. I mean, um, for instance, like, like I could tell you a million things about Nancy Pelosi, Kevin McCarthy, like I, you know, I, I, I've covered them for a long time. It's almost like covering it. Some of the criticism is like more like a sport, right? Um, but I would just argue that, you know, we write, Politico writes more for, for that political audience and does more of the turn of the screw type stories. Um, and that's why a lot of people read because they want to know, okay, who's influencing what legislation? Um, who is getting lobbied and their position is, you know, against this bill because they're getting, you know, this, somebody's giving them campaign donations or whatever. Like that's more of the, the political, the Politico focus. So I just, I would say, you know, I, that's sort of where things are at Playbook. We are very much covering more people and individuals and how one person has an impact on all these things mm -hmm. as opposed to the grander scheme. But I would just say that different media organizations have different emphasis. And that's I think you, but see, I think you all have been very clear eyed in the last few days about political violence and mm -hmm. extremism and about the attack at the Pelosi house. Yeah. Like, I think you all are managing to capture the, 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 the wind, the, the mood, the vibe, the, the threats you know, but I think that that's like an interesting tug of, uh, tug of war of sorts within journalism about and are like, we meeting that moment? And, and and you're right, different outlets do it in different ways. Right. Um, were you going to jump in and ask? Oh, I was just going to say, like, it's it's difficult to contextualize in absolutely every story how things are kind of interrelated mm. and, and interweaving, right? Right. A thousand word story is not the best format for explaining the entire political system. Right. And it gets to be sounding, Actually. exactly. And, and when you have, you know, Jerry Nadler stepping up and saying, this is an outrage, this blocking of, not just impeachment, right? Other investigations too, the general stonewalling, the, the questions about, you know, we're, you know, we're going to send this subpoena up and we're really, we really mean it this time. It, it starts to sound a little bit like a broken record from both sides, both the, the scrutiny of, you know, whether people are respecting Congress and the, 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 the whole like, yeah, because we're, we're going to really punch hard this time. And, and to put that into, into context in every story, you know, is, is difficult because it takes a little bit of a step back. It takes a little bit of a, okay, this isn't a breaking news item, right? This is a little bit of a, where are we and how did we get here sort of a situation. Mm -hmm. um, Looking at impeachment is a very unique circumstance, right? But if it doesn't work for impeachment, it's probably not going to work for every other form of oversight because that's not as durably guaranteed, right? And so, um, you know, kind of taking the step back and saying um, and assessing whether, like, generally speaking, the levers of power are working is a lot less news driven, a lot less sexy and a lot more academic, frankly, than the story about the latest impeachment, that, that latest subpoena that some committee is filing to try to get this specific information that it's going to inform this scandal that everybody's very, very grip, gripped with, uh, obsessed with in that moment, trying to, trying to figure out. And I think that's true across news organizations. It's, it's the, the good and the bad part of news, right? Like the, the, well, fine, we have op-ed pages for people to kind of like take a minute and step back. We occasionally do an analysis story, but it's usually got to have some sort of moving, developing hook, which is why you end up doing these things in books instead. <laughs> That's true. Uh, other questions? Yeah, right here. Is it? Uh, it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned early in the talk that you had heard from several Republican members of Congress about how, like, you know, they don't actually believe what Trump is saying. And that's a refrain that I think we heard from a lot of reporters over the course of the Trump years. And what I could never figure out is why they were telling you this. Um, so what do you, like, beyond just, you know, 
hanging out and you say the things you really believe when you're off the record, like what, what's the incentive for these members of Congress to continually divulge to reporters the fact that they're being completely two-faced? Honest, well, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> therapy. It's like, it, it is a weird form of perverse therapy. It, it's Why does Trump keep calling Maggie Haberman, who only yeah. writes for her? It's a weird sort of like, you know, going through a process of, I, I think. I mean, it, it's no, not a- it's, it is. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I covered, I also covered House Republicans before Democrats took, I covered the majority of the House. And like, we would hear this stuff all the time. And like, but again, you could see how powerful Trump was becoming because these member, like these members and these sources would like not put their name to stuff. A lot, some of them would let you like quote them on background, but they would just never spin on the record. But yeah, it was, yeah. it was constant. And it was striking how like when you, when you went back to the same people who were like mumbling about things and incomplete thoughts, all completely off the record in real time, right? And you go back and you're like, okay, we're not going to say according to like three staffers of this political persuasion. We're writing a book. It's voice of God. We are going to do all that sourcing, but we're not going to like put it yeah, in every other line because yeah. it'd be really pedantic right. and nobody would want to read it and it's long enough as it is. Yeah. Um, you would be surprised at the number of people who are just like, cool, here's what I've been wanting to say for a really long time. And here's what pissed me off about what my boss did or what, you know, the person who's my boss's boss did and like, or the leader of this, this whatever faction of Congress it is did and where I had to compromise on what I knew I wanted to do and what I'm afraid of the long-term consequences, how this is going to blow back on me in the future. And just, it was amazing how people just needed to spill their guts. And in this circumstance, like, look, the, the Trump years were some of the most highly scrutinized, covered years time of political journalism ever i would argue right but everybody was so focused on the president and like the curiosity that he was and the stress test that he was and the shock value of the president and so few people took a really hard look at the congress that was you know supposed to be doing something about this and wasn't and so it's like it, it was ripe for the the taking in a way. It was just that we decided to write a story, that, write a book that was more focused on Congress. And so it's like we presented the free therapy opportunity, I suppose, <laughs> that people took care, took more advantage of knowing it would be several months before things finally came out, nor knowing because of the time it takes to send a book through a printing press, even in a best case scenario, and, and knowing they would really not be able to be easily identified. Um, would just create an opportunity that I don't think people had been given. I will I will also say that we had Republican sources who, you know, we we met with for hours, hours. I mean, a lot of the sources we talked to for at least like six to ten hours. Some of them met mm -hmm. for literally like even more. Um, but some of them were very blunt, like right after the first impeachment and then after January sixth happened when we were doing our fact check stuff, they were they would try to take stuff back because they knew their names would be associated with things and they didn't as characters not as characters not as yeah not as yeah because like a lot of times like we don't we don't say where we get the information from in the book right you can gather that if we're telling a certain person's story we either got it from them or from one of their staffers or from one of their friends or one of the family members so like people around them but like we had republican sources who did sort of this venting session with us and then during our fact check process tried to take things back. And like, oh. of course we report everything. So we're going to stick to our reporting and what they told us initially. But again, it shows like how oh. people are still skittish, even oh, though yeah. Trump is gone, they're still skittish as, as ever been. I will say one of the nice things about doing a book and having more time to, 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 to track down the reporting was we were able to find multiple instances where that hypocrisy, we could name people and we could say, um, uh, for instance, like Kevin McCarthy and Jim Jordan top allies of Trump in the House, um, they were defending him publicly, his right to stonewall Congress and like totally ignore congressional subpoenas. Uh, but publicly, because of the reporting we did from multiple sources, we were able to, to report that privately they were freaking out about this stuff. So like this is, it's not on record coming from these guys, but we were able to report specific names of individuals who were having that two-faced moment where they were presenting something publicly and then privately trying to convince Trump that you need to respect Congress because you know this is it's bad for the institution if you don't if you don't cooperate and like so I would just say like even though we've had people sort of venting on background no names associated etc the the book reporting process has really allowed us to go deeper and get some of that those specific specific examples like just one more thing I'll say I my one of my favorite Jim Jordan anecdotes in the book he 
he he comes out of the skiff, which is where they were doing these um, these impeachment interviews. The, the skiff being the secure facilities in the they, where the they can review classified information. They have to leave their phones at the door, but yeah, it's in the basement of the Capitol at this long. You've probably seen pictures of the spiral staircase that, that goes down on the house side. It's yeah. It's a pit of doom, but because <laughs> uh, of how many hours we would stake out there, uh, hungry and thirsty and freezing. Um, but anyway, so Jordan goes in for the interview, finds out that Trump has stonewalled and not allowed a witness to appear who was supposed to show up that morning. He goes out in front of the cameras and he says, like, Trump absolutely has a right to do this. This is a witch hunt, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, we would do the same thing, too. And then he races, runs up the stairs, jumps in a car, races to the White House, and goes to the Oval Office to try to tell Trump that he should not be doing that. It's <laughs> just like the most beautiful example of like hypocrisy that that we have names for and we yeah. can name. And, right. and, and I would yeah, just, anyway. I just add one thing, which is yeah. not your question, but like <laughs> we've gotten some shade from people reading this book, consuming the book, being like, how, why, why didn't you tell us this time when it mattered? You know, oh, how could classic. you, how could you do this? Like you're, you were just trying to make money off of this. It, it took so much time to actually, we didn't know any of these details in real time. We had suspicions that something else was going on, but we had to literally go back in a completely different environment, no, doing something that everybody knew was a slower, slower role of the project mm -hmm. in order to be able to get this sort of information. And, and that's something that you just, that goes to what I was saying initially about we knew there was more to it. We just didn't have the time to pull back on every string while we were chasing the story. Yeah. But add that to the list of examples of, I don't want to say what's broken, but of of the um, the challenges that we that we all face in understanding politics in our in our society, which is the story is, I, I know this in media, the story is almost so much crazier on the inside than people know on the outside at the time. Oh, totally. And it's almost guaranteed. It's always worse on the inside than you know. Almost, in any story. Always. And the, other, the story that doesn't come out until later. It doesn't come out until later. And then at, at the point at which it comes out, everybody's got this view of how things work in their head, right? Mm, right. One of the other things that has made this book controversial in ways that we somewhat anticipated, anticipated, but not necessarily to the full extent of what's happened, people really don't like questioning their heroes, especially at a time at which the political stakes are really high. And, you know, there's physical guns out in some situations, like, you know, aimed across the aisle at people. Um, you know, people want to believe that if the person they're backing, if their intent was just in their eyes, then the execution was perfect, which has literally never happened in the history of time. But you, <laughs> but it, you I mean, you are hard pressed to convince people right. that it's worth looking in the mirror so that you, you know, you can learn from the missed opportunities, the mistakes, the, 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 the mm -hmm. things that didn't go perfectly mm -hmm. because, I mean, I'm, I, a, a much more famous and influential person than me he said, you know, people who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. That happened in short order, back to back impeachments, ah, right? Right. And, you know, it, it, it is still people aren't willing to scrutinize that. The stakes are now with the parties flip that you might actually have your guy be the one getting really dinged because, because of the recent history that you just don't want to think about trying to, to fix in, in, in ways that would be really uncomfortable, really politics doing the constitutionally, look, it, it wasn't a politically expedient decision to go down the, the Watergate investigative path, right? They did have more time. They had four years of his second term versus the final two years of Trump's first term. But it, it's political expediency and the hard slog of doing congressional oversight and everything that's part of that they don't never match. And, and you got to choose to go one way or the other. And it's very clear that people in both parties chose to go the more politically expedient route, even though they decided to take on this, this heavy burden, they didn't want to actually have to do all the weight lifting. Yeah. So with the house about to flip, what should we know about Kevin McCarthy? Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> so many things. <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I won't be the first one to say this, I'm sure, but I, I think it's pretty clear he's going to be one of the, the weakest speakers we've seen in a really long time. Um, and I mean, we show in the book how you know, McCarthy being a top Trump ally, it's a lot easier for him in the Trump in the Trump impeachment story because he's in the minority and he's fighting, you know, basically the, the Democratic majority that is impeaching Trump. And so he's not he's on Trump's side <laughs> in these two impeachments when he is speaker, which we expect he will be. Um, he's going to have to govern and he's going to have to 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 make deals with Democrats. And Trump is going to hate that. Uh, his Trump-like members are going to hate that. 
and they're going to come after him. And we've seen time and time again in this book and, and, other, and otherwise throughout Trump's term that when he's mad at McCarthy, McCarthy will go against his own gut and do what Trump wants to stay, you know, in his good graces. Mm. Um, because he believes if he wants to be speaker and he's got to be successful, um, he's going to have to follow, you know, what they want. And so we could potentially see a speaker who allows the government to shut down, uh, doesn't do funding deals because the Trump wing of the party is demanding that he do this. Right. Um, things like not raising the debt ceiling, potentially a default. Yeah, when I hear um, you say he has to do deals with yeah. Democrats, I'm saying, I'm thinking, why? What, why, One question: Why does he have to do deals with Democrats? Well, the thing is, well, isn't the, isn't the goal I guess to have to, to in terms of, of <laughs> have to in that like <laughs> these things were once considered like just things you have to do. You right. got to fund the government. Got to fund the government. Got to raise right. the debt right. ceiling. You got to do. You it's know, so you nice. got to take we're, care we're, of we're so old. We can remember when that was normal. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. wow. Um, so he's going to get choked around by 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 the Trump wing of the party, and he's not going to be able to, well, he could potentially fight back, but he will not, because we've seen many times that, like I said, when he wants to do something, we show in the book, for instance, that he didn't believe the big lie, that he didn't want to sign onto this court case challenging Biden's victory in swing states. He wasn't going to do it, and then he gets pressured by Trump to do it. He ends up doing it against his own moral compass. So we'll expect that from a future Speaker McCarthy. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, we'll see in a way, like it, it'll be interesting to see how McCarthy acts depending on what happens with the Senate, which I think nobody can predict right now which way that's going to swing, mm -hmm. um, or people are trying to predict. But mm -hmm. no one can know. No one knows for sure. But if if it seems pretty clear that the GOP is going to take over in the House, if the Senate remains in Democratic hands, that almost frees Kevin McCarthy up to act even more with the Trump wing of the party because there's that check, right, where you can't really get anything through. And clearly the Democratic led Senate is not going to let the, the particularly more, what's the word I'm looking for that won't sound <laughs> like it's opinionated, but um, we'll let the, is not going to let the, the really the really catering to the Trump wing of the party type legislation actually get through Congress and he'll know that. It's going to be a really interesting sort of, is there going to be any sort of self, self checking on McCarthy's part if it's Republicans in control of both chambers? And interesting to see how McConnell and McCarthy clash because oh. one is much more of a Trump Republican and one is much more of a classic. I mean, look, Ukraine, I cover the Pentagon now, aid for Ukraine is going to be one of the very first test cases for this. The McCarthy's Republicans don't want to keep funding it. McConnell's more hawkish Republicans do want the money to keep going. Who's going to win? Yeah. And just one more thought on McCarthy. Um, you'll see in news reports that he's currently pushing back against this idea of a Biden impeachment. But again, you have people like Jim Jordan, who's going to be the, the judiciary chairman, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's only a matter of time before they sort of, you know, overrun him. Um, it's funny because he's in the same position that Pelosi was in trying to say no impeachment. Uh, it took, <laughs> Pelosi's pretty good at controlling her caucus. Yeah, he's not her <laughs> nine months, nine months she was able to do it and then she couldn't anymore, but we'll see how quickly they overrun McCarthy. We have about five minutes left. We have an online question from Liz. Okay. Yep. We have actually two that are both on the same topic. So I'm gonna combine right. them. Um, they're both about horse race reporting in mm -hmm. politics um, and the problems of it, the well-documented problems with it. Um, so one question is, given that we know that from academic research and other things, what's the appetite for more coverage of policy topics within national newsroom leadership? And then the other question uh, is about what can be done to sort of break the habit of the horse race of the latest thing being the thing that, you know, mm -hmm. reporters have to focus on. Do you want to go first? Sure, because I work at Politico. Uh, <laughs> Listen, I, I'm going to, I go against the grain on this. I think there's room for a lot of different types of journalism. And I think there's absolutely room for, uh, for certain institutions in Washington to cover the twists and turns of politics. I think that if people are being dishonest, saying something publicly, and then going behind the scenes and whipping their members another way, like, I, I just think that that is important for accountability's sake. Um, and uh, it might not be like a broad brush story that the general population is interested in, but um, I, I still think there is room for that in, in media. And, um, you know, different institutions like the Washington Post, like I said, doing more broad, broader stories, there are, there's institutions doing that. But there's also like, there's an appetite 
for covering politics um, and like how the personalities are affecting things too. And so I, I personally um, love doing those kinds of stories and um, that's sort of why I guess I find myself back at Politico. So I guess I'm a little bit against the grain of that. So. Well, I'm not the politics person. I'm the person who would prefer to write about policy <laughs> um, and the person who isn't even on the Hill anymore. But um, it's an interesting, I mean, look, it's a dilemma, right? It's a constant one. Um, this kind of goes back to what Brian was saying before about people though having their two competing versions or multiple competing versions about what reality is, right? And so you can debate the actual substance of um, a policy topic, whether it's defense funding, whether it's food stamps, whether it's so many things, but people are coming at it from two so opposed or sometimes more perspective about what is good, what is bad? What is the, you know, what is the thing that should be invested in? What is the thing that shouldn't be invested in? Where do we even wanna to get to? There's no agreement about what the end goal is in a lot of these things. And usually it clashes head on real fast. And so that becomes then the policy debates get overtaken by politics. And so it's really hard to separate out the policy issue if you're covering the space in which the policy is being made, not just the place where it's being executed, that's a different story. But if you're trying to cover you know, the, the places where you're actually making the policy into laws that end up affecting, or, or even just funding bills, right? That end up um, driving what can actually happen, the politics are huge and they are part of the story. There was a time when I was getting in my most jaded phase on Capitol Hill, um, where I was basically talking about how like it feels like with so many stories, not every story, but it feels like with a lot of these stories, remember when you were in elementary school math and you had word problems that were really just there to test whether you knew how to add or subtract or divide or whatever. It was testing if you knew the equation or you knew yeah, whatever it was. my daughter now, yeah. Yeah, no, they're, they're great, right? I and the, come up with them. Right, exactly, because the, the, the circumstances always change, yeah. but the problem's always the same. Yes. And this is what it felt like trying to cover policy on Capitol Hill. The circumstances would change if you have a different topic, but it's still coming down to the same, same math, problem. the same people, yes. and their political personal, sometimes very petty issues. And where it gets interesting is where that equation starts to get flipped on its head, like where you have a weird marriage between, you know, Ted Cruz and Tim Kaine having the exact same position on something. It's like, whoa, that's not because the policy is the whoa, it's because the politics change. And all of a sudden that's created an opening where you can talk about the policy in a different, less political, more substantive way. But that word problem, problem, it's just there. And if you try to cover the issue Again, where the policy is being made. Different story if you're covering it from the agencies, but or from the ground, which is even more important in many ways than the DC-centric reporting. Um, you cannot divorce those and actually be reflecting reality. It would be journalistic malpractice to do that, frankly, because it does matter and it is very, very snarled and wrapped up. As frustrating as that is, that's where we are. Uh, I'm glad we get, we get questions from the live stream. Also, thank you for the questions. Let's see if there's any one more in the room. Uh, if not, we'll wrap it up. Um, that way we're out right, right on time. Uh, Corinne and Rachel, thank you both for coming and, and talking about this and sharing all the reporting. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you.